first paragraph? What what's the heading? Chapter eight: Historical Economics and the Revival of Mercantilism Thought in Britain, 1870 to 1920, by Gerard M. Coote. 1870 to 1920. Little cat. Oh yeah. Now I have a serious question. Why does a cat take a walk? Every day this cat takes a walk. Right? Yeah, I see him often. Yeah. Now, why does a cat take a walk? Why do you take a walk? Exactly. So the cat? He's probably got several do places have... where he has, where there's food or water. And what else? If no food or water? Then just to explore his territory. Pardon? You know, he could also be keeping his territory up against other cats, because he's not the only cat out here. Right. But my... May it be he derives a certain satisfaction of taking a walk? I don't see why not. I, I'm a I'm a mammal and I enjoy taking a walk. Yeah, that's my <laughs> question. However, if I asked myself last night and I saw him, if a cat takes a walk because the guy he doesn't have food or water here, walks as if he's just enjoying it. Mm -hmm. If a cat takes certain satisfaction from deriving a walk, then the cat has a question of cause and effect. His brain must realize that beforehand, that if he takes a walk, he's going to get a certain pleasure. So there must be a thought process oh. of cause and effect in the cat's brain. Cats are big fans of pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to ask Al Riley. In other words, I'm just wondering to myself, how much knowledge do we have as to why cats or dogs act the way they do. Well, there's a lot of study of cats and dogs. Question. I don't think dogs necessarily just take a walk for their for Oh, well, sure they do. They do? They well, are. they don't. Yeah, dogs get out of yards all the time and they wander all over the place. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They, <laughs> dogs why, love to run. Yeah, they sort of run and wander. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't have to solve <laughs> that <dog> problem. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so chapter 8. Yeah. Between 1870 and 1920, historical criticism of classical and neoclassical economics produced a body of economic history and applied economics that constituted a revival of mercantilist economics in Britain. A century after Adam Smith's critique of mercantilism, and a mere quarter century after the triumph of free trade in Britain, some British economists and economic historians began to question the wisdom of free trade policies for a Britain that now faced the competition of a united Germany and a dynamic United States, both of which turned to protection. For many, the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846 had seemed to usher in an age of unprecedented freedom of movement for capital, goods, and labor. It was fervently hoped that free trade would be adopted by other nations. This, many hoped, would usher in not only a period of unrivaled prosperity, but also an age of universal peace among the, quote, civilized powers. Moreover, some believed that Adam Smith's attack on the mercantilist system had finally succeeded in slaying the false gods of state intervention and national selfishness, variously known as mercantilism, the old colonial system, Various the old known, regime. Various known as mercantilism. Yeah. Well, he's giving several other names, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mercantilism, the old colonial system, the old regime, and old corruption. Right. At a famous dinner of the Political Economy Club to celebrate the centennial of the publication of The Wealth of Nations, speaker after speaker rose to praise the benevolent influence Adam Smith's brief for free trade had been on had had on Britain and its largely free trade empire, the commercial policies of other nations, and the subject of economics. Ominously, others rose to remind the audience that, as List had warned, developing nations might need to protect themselves from the British free trade empire. Even in Britain, all did not benefit equally from free trade, and laissez-faire left many pressing social problems unaddressed. Finally, the, destructive, the deductive method of orthodox economics seemed incapable of solving either its own theoretical contradictions or the social and economic problems of the time. Indeed, some argued that the age of laissez-faire was now passing and that political economy should accompany it. Footnote 1. 
Despite the unprecedented progress made toward the free movement of economic factors during the third quarter of the 19th century, in 1878, a mere two years after the Adam Smith dinner, Bismarck launched a neo-mercantilist program of state intervention that began with the adoption of industrial and agricultural protection. Tariffs were increased substantially in 1903. The United States also dramatically increased tariff barriers in 1890 and 1897. France adopted a general tariff in 1892. During the 1890s, even the British Dominions passed tariff legislation. In response, a, quote, fair trade movement developed in England in the early 1880s that demanded the abandonment of unilateral free trade and the adoption of at least retaliatory tariffs, footnote 2. The late 19th century also saw the widespread growth of nationalist and imperialist sentiment on both old and new powers that threatened Britain's position of international military, economic, and imperial preeminence that it had enjoyed during the height of the Pax Britannica. At home, a growing labor movement and a newly enfranchised population mounted a serious critique to the government's reluctance to promote state-sponsored social reform and to regulate industry. The fact that the United Kingdom did not introduce a general tariff until 1932 should not lead one to conclude that Britain's rejection of free trade took place only as a direct result of the world's economic crisis in 1929-32. In fact, the adoption of a general tariff in 1932 was the culmination of legislation that had begun with export subsidies for sugar in 1913 and the wartime McKenna duties of 1915. It was continued during the 1920s by various tariffs under the Safeguarding Acts, as well as by a host of empire marketing and development schemes. Footnote 3. Joseph Chamberlain's earlier tar tariff reform campaign may have been a failure, but his political daring had raised the issue of the role of the state in the economy to the center of British political life. Footnote 4. The immense slaughter of the Great War certainly hastened the demise of liberal liberal cosmopolitanism, but even before the war a vigorous tradition of neo-mercantilism had established itself in Britain. To be sure, the adoption of actual neo-mercantilist policies in the early 20th century Britain was largely a consequence of the successful lobbying of various specific business interests. Nonetheless, an important intellectual justification for these policies had been developed by critics especially historical critics, of orthodox economics. Late 19th and early 20th British social and political thought has been called, quote, corporatist, quote, social imperialist, quote, national efficiency, and, quote, neo-mercantilist, footnote 5. Neo-mercantilism, however, seems most useful in describing conservative as opposed to socialist and nationalist schemes of social and economic policy consisting of imperial federation, tariff reform, imperial preference, state-sponsored social reform measures such as old age pensions, and the state regulation of industry and labor. First, the academic proponents of neo-mercantilism, the historical economists, rehabilitated the history of mercantilism in Britain. Second, they constantly reiterated the proposition that mercantilist economics, however imperfect, was at least a political economy that sought to deal with the pressing issues of the day. Third, they argued that mercantilism's concern for the welfare of the community was a superior moral and mental framework to that of a neoclassical economics that emphasized the welfare of the individual and the firm. Fourth, while orthodox economics, except in its more popular and more dogmatic form, had never exclusively championed laissez-faire or free trade, its presumption and policy pronouncements were clearly in favor of non-intervention. The historical economists, however, frontally attacked these ideals. Finally, the term neo-mercantilism had been coined by the Germans in reference to English supporters of these policies. Footnote 6. The term is used here in the broadest sense, as illustrated, for example, by L. L. Price in a 1902 article on tariff reform. Price, an Oxford applied economist and economic historian who had studied under Marshall, argued that a tide of national feeling was sweeping the world. Is it Price? Yes. What's, his, what's the initials? What's his first name? L. L. 
L.L. Price. Yep, 1902. Okay. I think it was a Canadian. Let's go ahead. Uh, Maybe not. Price, an Oxford applied economist and economic historian who had studied under Marshall, argued that a tide of national feeling was sweeping the world. Quote, this national feeling will be allowed by the candid observer to harmonize more evidently with the ideas of the mercantilist system than with those of free trade. Despite many qualifications, Price concluded, quote, free trade is, quote, cosmopolitan and protection is, quote, national. Proponents of neo-mercantilism in Britain had to put forth their ideas in an intellectual climate that regarded mercantilism as both a failed policy of the past and as an unwise and immoral program for the future. In economics, advocates of mercantilism were the chief protagonists in the British method methodenstreit. The latter was not, as many have argued, a pale reflection of the more famous German methodological debate between the deductive Austrian economic theorists and the inductive German historical school. Rather, the British Methodenstreit of the late 19th century was a wide-ranging dispute over the appropriate use of an inductive or deductive method in economic study, the role of the scientist in society, competition over academic posts, and intellectual territory within the universities, and, most importantly, broadly dissimilar social and political ideals. Footnote 8. While Marshall and his allies vigorously defended both deductive economics and liberal free trade policy, most of the writings of the English historical economists can be characterized as neo-mercantilist. Footnote 9. They insisted that the more inductive and practical methodology of the mercantilist writers was superior to the abstractions of the classical economist, economists. They also believed that mercantilism's nationalist concerns, its faith in corporate responsibility for the welfare of the people, and some aspects of its scheme for state regulation were more desirable than what they called the system of laissez-faire. Unable to dislodge both the dominant laissez-faire tradition and the primacy of orthodox economic theory, historical economists such as William Cunningham, W.J. Ashley, and W.A.S. Hewins developed an academic tradition of economic history and applied economics that was more sympathetic to neo-mercantilist policies. Their neo-mercantilist economic history sought to show that Britain first climbed the ladder of economic success with the help of mercantilist policies. Furthermore, its adoption of free trade in the 19th century could be characterized as the, quote, imperialism of free trade, whose goals had been essentially similar to those of mercantilism. Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> some new. One recent writer, Magnuson, who wrote an excellent book, I think, on the develop world economic development from zero to 1999. And I died about six months ago. First time I heard a person use the term. Uh, Free trade imperialism. Is that what they are said to? Uh, free trade the imperialism of free trade. Oh, yeah. He calls he called it the free trade imperialism. Or no, he did, did call it that imperial. Impe no, he called it imperialist free trade. Yeah. And here they call it the imperialism of free trade. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Seems to be contradictory terms, but not really. In other words, Britain had free trade, but it also had the imperialism to deal with, with exceptions. Right. Hmm. Uh, Earlier in the century, the work of the, quote, national economists, especially that of Friedrich List in Germany, anticipated and influenced many of the neo-mercantilist arguments of the latter historical economists. List, who became famous as the advocate of a German Zollverein, owed many of his ideas to a, tra a free trade area. Zollverein. Zollverein? Yeah. Free trade area? Mm -hmm. Well, common market. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Zollverein, uh, common market. Now go ahead. Owed many of his ideas to a tradition of American national economics. He explained that the purpose of his Das National System der Polischen 